Welcome to the State of DM1 Research and Ways to Engage session. This session is part of the DM1 track. It's intended for individuals living with DM1 and their families. The session is being recorded, so it will be available for viewing after the conference on the MDF Digital Academy, and that's www.myatonic.org slash digital dash academy. And this is, there we go. Okay, Dr. Statlin is a professor of neurology at the University of Kansas Medical Center in Kansas City, Kansas. His research background has centered primarily on describing the natural history of and response to therapy for neuromuscular diseases. He completed a neuromuscular fellowship in experimental therapeutics of neurological diseases at the University of Rochester Medical Center and currently serves as principal investigator or co-investigator for research studies in FSHD, Duchenne muscular dystrophy, spinal muscular atrophy, and myotonic dystrophy. Dr. Satlin's specific research interest over the last six years has been preparing for clinical trials in FSHD. He has systematically analyzed performance of strength and functional outcomes in prior FSHD clinical trials and compared to performance in a natural history study. He's worked with collaborators to develop new disease relevant outcome measures to assess patient reported disease burden, functional impairment, and physiological changes in muscle. He has obtained pilot data on the use of a number of novel outcomes for FSHD, including electrical impedance myography, a disease specific functional rating scale, and a wireless motion analysis system. So it is my great pleasure to introduce you to Dr. Statland. Take it away. Thank you, Tanya. And I wanna thank the MDF for inviting me to discuss the state of DM1 research and ways to engage at what I think is a real transition point for uh, DM1 research. Some of you may recognize the photograph I have here in this slide. These are immigrants, they're on Ellis Island. You can see them, they're looking out at the brave new world, which was the skyline of New York City. You can see they have their history, all their belongings packed in the bags at their feet. And they're looking out at a world that's really full of opportunity, hope, but also many challenges to come. I think in many of the same ways, in DM1 research, we're looking out at a brave new world, which is our gene-targeted therapies. We have all the things we know about myotonic dystrophy sort of packed in the baggage at our feet, and we're looking out at this world of opportunity, hope, but also challenges. Today, I want to discuss the state of research, but I'm going to pay particular attention to clinical trials and the research that really supports them. These are my disclosures, and I have to say it does include consulting for some companies that do research in myotonic dystrophy. So as I mentioned, I think we're really at a transition. There's been a revolution in treatment. Even 10 years ago, there were really less than 10 clinical trials in neuromuscular diseases at the academic institution I'm working at, the University of Kansas Medical Center. Now we have 90 active neuromuscular clinical trials. Molecularly targeted therapies are becoming a reality. Some of the technologies um, would have seemed like science fiction just even a decade ago. Things like gene therapy, gene editing, RNA targeted therapies, but they're not science fiction anymore. This is a list of FDA approved medications for neuromuscular disorders over the last 10 years. And you can see in red, all of the ones in red are gene targeted therapies, either RNA based therapies or true gene therapies each of which is being considered for myotonic dystrophy now. Another way of looking at the state of research in myotonic dystrophy is to look at the number of scientific publications related to myotonic dystrophy. 
And what you're looking at on this graph is the number of publications on a, a large resource called PubMed, starting from 1950 on the right, going up to the present day on the left. And the first thing you'll notice is that number of publication is in steadily increasing. And part of this is certainly advances in our number of journals and just more people working in the field. But a lot of the specific increases are related to scientific advancements in our understanding of myotonic dystrophy. Early on, you can see there were papers describing the multi-system nature of myotonic dystrophy. Then you can see when we discovered the location of the genetic defect that causes myotonic dystrophy type 1 in the early 90s, there's a sudden increase in the number of publications. And that represents more researchers and more people moving into the field. There was a lull for a few years, but then you can see this was followed by the discovery of the genetic defect for myotonic dystrophy type 2, and then really a key event, which was solving the molecular changes that cause myotonic dystrophy, which really identified a target for therapy. And you can see it here in this illustration, those long CTG repeats becoming RNA and the RNA forming clumps in the cell that are causing the disease. After that discovery, you can see there's a rather dramatic increase in the number of publications. Again, this representing new people coming into the field, new eyes, new ways of thinking about things. And over the next few years, we saw people starting to develop the models that we would use to test potential therapeutics. We saw the first rescuing of an animal model, um, reversing the myotonic phenotype in that mouse. And then finally, you can see the clinical trials starting in our first uh, true gene-targeted clinical trial by Ionis, which unfortunately wasn't successful, but I think we learned a lot as a field from that study. This is our current therapeutic landscape for myotonic dystrophy taken from clinicaltrials.gov, a US registry of clinical trials that if you attend the session by Nick Johnson tomorrow, I think he'll be showing you more about how to use that. And you have to remember that we're currently in the middle of a pandemic, but even now there's a lot going on. There's a lot of research. Up here, you can see there's several studies that have recently been completed, but we have multiple studies that are in progress despite the pandemic. There's a very large international effort by the Myotonic Dystrophy Research Network that again, you'll be hearing more about tomorrow. This is to help build the tools that we use in a clinical trial, things like biomarkers and clinical endpoints. There are two companies, Harmony Bioscience, who have a new class of molecules to address excessive daytime sleepiness, and Avidity, who have a true RNA-based gene therapeutic for myotonic dystrophy that are starting their clinical trials right now. And there's several other companies in the process of getting their programs up and running. So what I want to do today, I think it's only fitting that I'm going to start and finish my talk talking a little bit about collaborations in research, because it really is a collaboration between all stakeholders if we're going to make any advancements in our knowledge about treatments for myotonic dystrophy. I'm then going to step back and talk a little bit about therapeutic targets. And now I know that this may be a little redundant. Some of you may have had a session earlier where they went over the genetics, but it's important to understand this so we can understand what some of these new treatment modalities are trying to do. We're going to look at those model systems that help support drug development. I'm going to talk a little bit about a few recently completed clinical trials, and I've chosen these strategically not to be specifically gene-based because I want us to realize there are other ways for us to think about treating people with myotonic dystrophy. Then I'm going to switch gears and talk about some of those future approaches to therapy that are gene targeted. 
and finish up the, the afternoon by talking again about collaborative um, nature of research. And so here, this is a figure. This is outlining the process of drug development in the United States. You'll see this figure again tomorrow if you go to the preclinical uh, trial development workshop. Um, you'll see that the, um, the figure is actually split into four sections. And if you look on the left, you can see pre-discovery. This is all the research that's gone on before we think about drug development, understanding what myotonic dystrophy is, how it affects the body, learning about the genetic cause for it, and then what that does to uh, affect those different body systems. Once that's done, we enter what's called the preclinical phase, and we'll talk about this. This is where we think about model systems and testing drugs before we're ready to test them in people. Clinical trials are what most of you think about. These are the studies in humans, and these are the three phases that many of you have heard about, phase one, two, and three studies. And then finally, there's post-marketing approval monitoring. This is actually a whole field of research where we can compare the effectiveness of different approaches to things like our cardiac care, or our pulmonary care. And once we have drugs, it may be comparing different drugs for treatment and how we implement them, but I'm not going to be talking about that today. When we look at the actual drug development pathways, there's two things to notice. If you look at the compounds themselves, you can see that there's a trend where they go from really an infinite number of compounds and then they're winnowed down over the process into just a handful that ever really make it into human studies. And this process is important because we wanna know that the drugs that we're gonna move forward for, uh, with are safe and at least show some potential signs for effectiveness before we wanna start testing them in people. Once we enter people, you see an opposite trend, where as you go through the phases, the number of people who are involved starts going up the time it takes to complete the studies gets longer and the cost of the studies gets higher. In phase one, we're really just asking, are things safe and how, what dose are we gonna give people? When we enter phase two, we start to ask questions about does the drug get where it needs to go and is it doing what it's supposed to do? Is it helping people? When we get to phase three, we're really asking the broader question, is it safe and is it going to help the general person with myotonic dystrophy? Is it going to be effective if we approve it for marketing? When we think about the process of drug development, it's really a collaborative effort. And we as the myotonic community are the stakeholders in this process. We need to be providing the input and direction. We need the tools in place so we can be confident we're not throwing out drugs which might actually help people and we're not approving drugs that won't help. And when we think about tools and clinical trials, these are outcome measures. Drug development is really a conversation that has many participants. It has people like me, people in industry, your advocacy groups like the MDF, and people with myotonic dystrophy and their family members. Everyone really has a role. Our basic scientists help us understand the disease. They identify new targets for therapies. They develop model systems so we can test new drugs, and we'll return to this a little later. And they develop our new therapeutic strategies. But at a certain point, they need to hand this off to the pharmaceutical industry because we need companies who can do the large studies that it takes to get drug approval, who can manufacture and distribute the drug and make sure people are getting it, um, and who can do all the complicated processes that are required for true drug authorization. We need people like you and your family members um, developing treatments is a true collaboration. Without people volunteering for studies, we can't make any 
progress. Your participation really means a lot. You help us figure out what aspects of myotonic dystrophy we need treatments for, what things are going to be important to measure, how big a change would be important to you. And this may change from one person to the next, and it may depend on the treatment. You help us understand what risk is accept acceptable for any potential benefit. And you help us design our studies, how long a visit is too long, how many visits are reasonable, what kind of procedures are acceptable to do. Is a biopsy acceptable? On the academic side, we still have a lot of work that needs to be done. We need to ensure that we're standardizing our techniques for how we measure things. We need to address gaps in understanding what happens clinically to people over time. We need to make sure we're developing those outcome measures for the clinical trials and make sure our results are consistent when we implement them across multiple locations. It's a process of innovation and collaboration. Initially, we want people all over the world in their separate laboratories doing their own things, thinking of new ways to measure myotonic dystrophy, thinking of new avenues for treatment, thinking outside the box. But at a certain point, we need all these people to then come together so we can test these new ideas in large groups of people. We need to prepare. We want things that work for all people with myotonic dystrophy. And we need to ensure our assumptions about what we're measuring and how we're doing it are really true. What are we doing to help ensure this? Well, we put together a myotonic dystrophy clinical trial research network and it's really grown tremendously. You can see all the sites in the United States who are currently taking part, as well as sites in Europe and the UK. You're gonna learn a little bit about one of the studies that's going on, a biomarker and clinical endpoint study in the trial preparedness workshop tomorrow. And as I said, it's a collaborative process. And so if you're wanting to take part or learn how you can help I just ask you to reach out to our project manager. Her email's here, and you'll see it again later in my talk. I want to switch gears now and talk a little bit about what are the therapeutic targets that we're going to address. Understanding these therapeutic targets was key to us getting true gene-targeted therapies for the field. I know you had a talk about this earlier, so I'm not going to go too in depth into this, but the, um, the mutation that causes uh, myotonic dystrophy is carried on DNA. DNA carries the recipes that cells use to make proteins. We, it's stored on our chromosomes. We get two sets of recipes, one from each of our parents. In myotonic dystrophy, there's a region with these CTG repeats that's on chromosome 19 that gets expanded. Here you just see an example from a normal person. You can see in red the CTG repeats. In myotonic dystrophy, that region is greatly expanded. You can see now there's hundreds of CTG repeats. The expansion is in a gene name for the disease, the myotonic dystrophy protein kinase gene. But the issue is not really with the protein product, but it's with these expanded repeats. In order for the cell to make any recipe, it actually has to copy that recipe down into something we call messenger RNA. And that messenger RNA will take that recipe out into the kitchen where it'll make the protein. But the problem here is that expanded MRA forms sticky clumps. You can see an example of it uh, in this, this picture, which is a muscle cell. You can see the green is the muscle fiber. The blue is the control center of the cell where we keep DNA. That red color is that mRNA. And you can see it's clumped up in this little sticky globs. Regulatory proteins, you can think of them as factory floor managers get stuck to those clumps, and they can't direct the cell to do what it needs to do. In the top right, you can just see an example of it. 
the RNA is in red again. One of those regulatory muscle uh, proteins called muscle blind is in green, and you can see that they're overlaying each other. When we think about what muscle blind does, well, it processes many hundreds of different proteins. And you can see a list here of just some of the key areas that are affected in myotonic dystrophy. And you can see that for some of them, we know exactly which misregulated proteins are causing the difficulty. For example, the chloride channel and something we call myotonia or failure of the muscles to relax weakness in calcium channel genes. We can see conduction problems due to sodium channel gene misprocessing. And we can see things like insulin resistance due to changes in the insulin receptor genes. But it's worth noting that many of the areas are still unknown. So we're still learning about this. This is a cartoon illustration of the pathological cascade showing that there's many different areas where we could consider treatments. On the top, it's, this is just showing you that CTG repeated region on the DNA. It's copied into RNA. This is where the problem is at the level of the RNA. The most common mechanism that most of our drugs are targeting are these RNA clumps where these regulatory proteins like muscle blind or other regulatory proteins are getting altered or stuck. You can see a cartoon illustration in the top right that could be how we can think about a drug working. There's nothing inherently missing in myotonic dystrophy. We don't have an altered structural protein in a muscle causing the disease. We have a regulatory protein getting bound up. And so one approach would be unbinding that regulatory protein. Another might be cutting up those RNA clumps. A different way that RNA may be causing problems inside the cell is these long strips of RNA. Well, they may not be affecting the protein that they're part of, but small pieces of them can get translated this is RAN translation with little tiny peptides getting made that if they accumulate can be toxic to the cell. And in the future, we may hear about some therapies that may target that pathway. When we think about the classes of drugs that are being developed for myotonic dystrophy, really all classes are being developed. Small molecules are what most of us think about when we think of drugs. It's sort of like the molecules you can think of working with in a chemistry class. RNA-based therapies are a little different. They're taking the chemical structure of RNA and they're using them to target genes or gene regulation. Gene therapy typically uses some kind of viral vector to deliver something to the cell that can be a new gene or it can be one of those RNA uh, therapeutics that we're going to talk about. And finally, cell therapies, which are often regenerative therapies like stem cells. All classes are being developed for myotonic dystrophy. So this raises the prospect for a very robust drug pipeline. This is a cartoon illustration of where we're at with drugs in development for myotonic dystrophy. Notice they have the same pathway I showed you the figure of earlier, preclinical phase one, phase two, phase three. To the right, they have symptoms related to myotonic dystrophy. To the left, they have the molecular cascade that causes myotonic dystrophy. And on the bottom, they have these drug classes I told you about. The squares are small molecules, and you can see several of them here addressing the symptoms of the disease and drugs like lunolazine, mixilatine, and metformin. These are repurposed drugs. They're already approved for other diseases like cardiac disease or diabetes, and we're repurposing them to treat symptoms of myotonic dystrophy. But what I really want to pay attention to is this bottom left here. 
The circles are RNA-based therapies, and those triangles are true gene therapies. And you can see we have a lot of them that are sitting in that preclinical space about to move into their first in human studies. And indeed, some of the ones listed here, like Avidity's drug product, is now crossed over into a phase one study. And Pitolisant here has crossed over into a phase two study um, for excessive daytime um, sleepiness. And I think we're going to see more and more clinical trials over the next few years. But we can't have this drug development if we don't have model systems to test these drugs. We need a way to winnow down the almost infinite possibility of different approaches to treatment into those few that appear to be safe and will work. And that's what model systems do for us. The simplest kind of model system we can think about using are cell cultures. Most of our labs across the country can grow cell cultures. These are standard cell lines that have been engineered to grow in a very automated fashion in the laboratory. They're quite robust, and it's a safe way to screen prospective drugs. One of the most common and widely used cell lines is known as a HeLa cell line. Some of you may have heard about this. HeLa stands for a person, Henrietta Lacks. She was a Black woman who had gone to be seen at Johns Hopkins University and a biopsy from a cancer she, she had became the cell line. It was grown and reproduced and is now one of the widest cell lines used in the world. You can read about it in an autobiography called The Mortal Life of Henrietta Lacks. If you haven't seen this, I urge you to go and read it. It's quite fascinating. But in the top right, you can see how we can engineer these cells. On the left is the normal HeLa cell line that's grown in the lab. And on the right, you can see the same cells where they've added those CTG repeats. And you can see the red color is the um, the, the clumps of RNA that are forming when those CTG repeats are transcribed, those sticky clumps. Because the growth of the cell is automated, we can have these plates that has hundreds or even thousands of little wells with these cells growing in them. And you can have a machine that can automatically put different drugs into each of the wells. And then we have a chemical marker that has a color to it, like you see above in this picture that can be quantified. And that can allow us to count up how many of those RNA inclusions are there. And we can set some sort of artificial threshold, like a reduction in the number of RNA clumps by 50%. And we can look at these few here. There aren't that many, but there's 10 or 15 that are reducing the RNA clumps that are in this drug library. And then we can ask, what drug is it? In this case, from this study, it was a class of drugs known as microtubular inhibitors. And indeed, one of them, colchicine, is already marketed for gouty arthritis. And so it becomes a potential disease-targeted therapy um, for myotonic dystrophy that could be repurposed but it would need to have more information before we'd be ready to move forward. The next level up of cell models is to take cells from people with myotonic dystrophy. This has higher face validity, right? We want cells from people who have the disease. This is a more natural expression of the disease and lots of different cell types have been used for this. You can take it from muscle or skin or the blood, we then chemically change the cells. This is a process called immortalization. We change them so they can be grown in culture over and over repeatedly in a lab. This allows us to do more than one experiment with them. They can also chemically be changed back into tissues, in this case, a muscle cell, 
a neuron or a cardiac cell. And you can see there's a lot of different things that we can do with these here. One thing that we can do is we can use these cells to learn about the disease. What are the molecular cascades that these uh, CTG repeats are causing in people? We can identify biomarkers that might be used for clinical trials. And we can also screen new drugs, either drug libraries or specific gene-targeted therapies. This is just an illustration from example of it, someone using what's called an IPSC line from someone developed from someone with myotonic dystrophy. You can see they have two different cell lines that they developed. It's a little hard to see in these photos. The green color are myotubes, the blue are the myonuclei. If you can see it, the pink dots, those are the RNA inclusions that we've been talking about. They then treated these cells with a RNA-based therapy known as an antisense oligonucleotide, or ASO. This directly targets those RNA inclusions and cuts them up. If you can't see it in the pictures, you can see it illustrated here in the bar graph. The black are untreated, and you can see that there's around 100 RNA foci of clumps of RNA. And you can see in gray, these are the cells after being treated with that RNA-based therapy. And those, those RNA clumps aren't there anymore. They've been cut up inside the cell. We can then take it a step farther and say, well, we reduced those RNA inclusions. Did we free up that regulatory protein, muscle blind, and allow it to do its job? And we can look at one of the proteins that it regulates, BIN1, which has a role in the health of the muscle. And we can see here on the left in a cell that um, is unaffected, there's around 20 to 30% of a particular form of this protein there. You can see in our affected cell lines, that's dramatically reduced below 10%. And then when we treat it with the RNA therapeutic, it doesn't get back to normal, but it gets back close to normal. And so there's an improvement on the molecular level that frees up the protein regulator and an improvement then on the protein level. The final step for testing new drugs is to go out of cells and to go into animals because we might wanna ask at the whole animal level, can the drug help someone? Can it show us signs that it may improve? And they've been able to engineer several mouse models that mimic different aspects of myotonic dystrophy. All of them mimic the molecular aspect. Here you see the blue myonuclei and those red RNA clumps that we see that are so characteristic of myotonic dystrophy. Some of the mice are better to show you myotonia or muscle wasting. Others are better for showing you cardiac toxicity. In this case, they're treating one of them with one of those RNA therapies, an antisense oligonucleotide that targets these inclusions and cuts them up. And then down below, you can see the result of that. In an untreated animal, they have myotonia and they have it because the animals don't express the normal chloride channel. The way we can think about the chloride channel for a muscle cell, if a muscle cell was like a gun and it's contracting was like the gun firing, the chloride channel is the spring in the trigger. And it's normally a tight spring. It's hard to pull the trigger. But if you don't have chloride channel there, that spring becomes very loose and that trigger fires over and over. And that repeated firing is that cell's inability to relax. And we can actually measure that with the needle. If you stick it in the muscle, you'll see that the muscle's firing over and over. But you can see here that the animal treated with that RNA therapeutic no longer has so much myotonia because the normal chloride channel is now being expressed. 
So where does that leave us? It leaves us in a good place. We have cell lines and animal models that help us learn about the disease and screen new therapies. It helps us explore the initial dose response and toxicology for drugs. Having models attracts industry to the field. They have something to test their products in before they go into people. Other models may be developed to mimic different aspects of myotonic dystrophy as we move forward with drug development. I wanna take a little time now, and I wanna talk about a couple recently completed clinical trials. And I wanna pick trials that are a little different because I wanna make sure that while we're all very excited about gene-targeted therapies, that we don't forget that there's other ways that we could be helping people. And the first study I wanted to highlight is a study that wasn't a drug study at all. It was a study of a behavioral therapy. And so the reason I'm interested in it is because in a chronic progressive condition like myotonic dystrophy, small changes in your lifestyle may have really meaningful effects on your life. This was a four center study, study in Europe and the UK. It was single blind, which we'll return to, randomized people to a behavioral treatment or standard of care and 255 people entered that study and they were followed for 10 months. The overall study design was really used to target physical activity and fatigue, which many people complain about. When we think about the inclusion criteria, it's always important to look at these because this tells you how applicable would this be to me? They were looking at adults. These people did have to experience severe fatigue and they were still able to walk independently. As I mentioned, they were randomized to this behavioral therapy plus an optional exercise regimen or to whatever was standard of care for their country. The term single blind means that someone didn't know what they were getting. Obviously, the people who were getting behavioral therapy or exercise knew they were doing it, so it wasn't them that was blind, but the people who were evaluating the outcomes didn't know what they were doing. Cognitive behavioral therapy is a type of talk therapy. The areas that they really targeted for improvement were regulating sleep and wake patterns, compensating for reduced initiative, formulating helpful beliefs about fatigue and myotonic dystrophy, optimizing social interactions and coping with pain. The exercise that they chose to do was mild to moderate and included things like walking, cycling, jogging, or dancing. Their primary outcome was a questionnaire, something you fill out. It just asked you questions about your activity level and your social interactions. If you got a zero on the score, it meant you really weren't doing very much, but 100% would be someone who was active and involved um, going out and doing things. But they also looked at other things, like how far you could walk in six minutes. They looked at um, how much activity you did in a 24-hour period using a little digital device you would put on your person that would measure your activity levels. And they also ask people questions about their fatigue and their daytime sleepiness or depression. I apologize for the blurriness of this table, but this is just listing all of the outcomes from the study. The ones in white really showed no effect, but the ones in yellow all showed an improvement with the therapy. And I think the point I want to make here is the point we started with that small changes can have real meaningful effects on someone's life, not just on your impression of fatigue or depression, but also on activity levels. When people felt better, they were doing more. They were able to walk farther in six minutes and they were able to increase their activity levels over the day. But we can learn so much more from studies like this. They also were able to look at the genetics of the individuals 
And some of you may know that there is a relationship between the number of repeats you have on your genetic test and how old people are when they first get symptomatic. And you can see at the extremes where there's really a larger number of repeats, people typically get symptomatic at a younger age. And when there's a smaller number of repeats, they're becoming symptomatic at an older age. This isn't a very dramatic effect, but what they discovered in this study is they could look at some other genetic factors buried within those long repeats of CTG. Some people had other variants, CCG or CGG, and when they were present, they appeared to be protective. These people were becoming symptomatic at an older age, and when we look at the offset of that age, it was about 12 years older than people who didn't have this. This would be an important finding if it was proven to be true because it would have clinical implications and may have implications for clinical trials, but it really needs validation in another group of people. The second study that I wanted to highlight is a study of a drug called mixilitine. This is not a gene targeted therapy. It's not a new agent. This is an example of a repurposed drug, a drug already approved for another indication, in this case, cardiac disease. It's important to know about these kinds of studies because the pathway to approval can be shorter because we already know a lot about the safety of drugs like that. In this case, this drug is used to treat one of the cardinal symptoms of myotonic dystrophy, the myotonia. This was a true randomized placebo-controlled double-blind study that had 40 individuals who either got mixilitine or a placebo. The amount of mixilitine they were giving was 150 milligrams three times a day, and they wanted to see if it improved function over six months. When we look at who they're including in their study, well, again, it was adults, but they were looking for people who had some evidence of myotonia to improve and who were still able to walk independently. Their primary outcome was how far someone could walk in six minutes, but they looked at a number of other things. They looked at a quantitative measure for how quickly you could relax your hand after you squeeze it tightly, so how quickly you can open it. They looked at a number of other functional measures like walking a certain distance or climbing stairs. They looked at strength and a, a whole variety of questionnaires that asked people whether their symptoms were improving or not. Everyone in the study was blinded to what they were getting. So the people who participated during the study wouldn't know what they were getting, and the doctors and evaluators also wouldn't know. When we look at the results of this study, you can see the change in distance that the people could walk in six minutes here on the y-axis. Blue are people getting the drug. The red are people getting placebo. And you can see that there does appear to be an effect at three months, but by six months, this effect on function, at least, had largely worn off. On the other hand, looking at that quantitative myotonia, how quickly the hand opens up, you can see that there did appear to be a benefit that persisted at both three and six months. But was it a meaningful effect? Because when we looked in this trial and tried to compare it to the questions about symptoms of myotonia, the two didn't really correspond. People weren't saying that their symptoms were improving, even though we were able to measure them. And so there's a number of take homes from these two studies for us as we move forward. People with myotonic dystrophy, I think, are highly motivated to participate in trials, whether they're disease targeted or they're behavioral. We can complete trials in a timely fashion, um, even if they're at limited number of sites, because myotonic dystrophy is one of our more common muscular dystrophies. 
although the mixilitine trial did require some loosening of their inclusion criteria. And we still need a better understanding of our outcome measures, our tools for measuring things. What size of the change is going to be meaningful? Is there anything we know at the beginning of the study related to genetics, gender, or functional performance, which will predict how someone will do over the course of the study? Are there better ways to measure things? What we measure for myotonia might not be the same as what people say they're experiencing. And are we measuring everything that is important to people with myotonic dystrophy type 1? These will be even more important questions as we get to gene-based therapies that may have a higher risk versus benefit profile. I want to switch gears now and talk about some of those gene-targeted therapies. And I think some of you may have heard some of our companies talking about their platforms earlier today. I wanted to start with the RNA-based therapies because in a way these have come the farthest and they're closest to clinical trials. Indeed, there's a clinical trial starting for one right now. So what is an antisense oligonucleotide therapy? If you remember, DNA carries the recipes for our cells, RNA copies those recipes and can carry those instructions out to the part of the cell that makes the proteins. They have particular sequences and these sequences can be read by the cell and turned into information. Antisense drugs just match up to particular areas of either RNA or DNA. It gives them specificity in the cell. They can locate particular areas where genetic events are occurring and cause things to change. Similar chemistries to this have already been used for drug approval for different diseases like myotonic dystrophy and spinal muscular atrophy, which gives us a leg up if we're wanting to approach the FDA with these drugs. How are we thinking about using them? Well, remember that cartoon figure we showed? There's a number of ways, but all of them are targeting that RNA, that long strip of RNA that forms clumps. We're either targeting them to cut them up and degrade them. We're unsticking those regulatory proteins to allow them to go do their job. We may take a slightly different approach and try and upregulate the expression of the regulatory protein to compensate for the fact that some of it's tied up. Or we may actually try to prevent the transcription of those long repeats. These would all be viable targets. The same thing is just illustrated here in a cartoon illustration. Here's the DNA with those CTG repeats. This is the RNA that forms those large clumps. This is one of those regulatory proteins getting stuck to it. Those green circles with the crosses, these are those RNA-based therapies. And you can see there's multiple ways it may work. It could cut up the RNA and dissolve it. It could interfere with the interaction between the regulatory protein like muscle blind and the RNA inclusions, or we could even prevent the transcription in the first place. These would all be important for myotonic dystrophy. We've had one trial already of an ASO therapy in myotonic dystrophy. Some of you may have been in it and some of you may remember it. It was the company Ionis and their study unfortunately didn't show a clear effect of the drug, but we learned a lot from that study. And one thing we learned that one problem we had was that not enough of the drug was getting into the muscle. And so one solution to this that's being used by several companies is to attach that RNA therapeutic to an antibody that can recognize the muscle cell. Dyne has an example of this, and this is taken from their website illustrating how their drug works. You can think of the antibody 
like the address on an envelope, it tells the cell to take this to the muscle and it has something particular on the muscle that it recognizes. It has a linker molecule that then it attaches to the RNA therapeutic. And so it takes it to the muscle and then delivers that RNA therapeutic inside. And so I think it's quite exciting that this may be a way to overcome that barrier and get enough of the drug to the muscle where we might see an effect. Another way to get around that problem would be to use some of the technologies used in gene therapies. In gene therapy, the typical model is to package either a gene, but it could also be an RNA therapeutic, or it could be gene editing enzymes, and put them inside a viral capsid, a virus that has a predisposition to go to particular tissues, in this case, to the muscle. And you can imagine we would put this inside that virus. The virus would go inside your body. It would locate the muscle, and then it will deliver whatever's inside. This can be an RNA-based therapy, or it could be a gene. You may know that one of the vaccines for COVID uses a similar technique to deliver a small transcript for DNA that makes a COVID protein to our immune system. There are also drugs that deliver genes that have been improved for SMA using a technique like this. But the benefit of getting it to the muscle does need to be weighed against a risk that our bodies has an immune response to that viral capsid that carries the molecule. There are two things that I probably get more questions about than anything else. And one of them is gene editing. And it's always shocking to me how many of the patients that I see ask me what I think about CRISPR-Cas9. CRISPR, if you don't know, stands for Clustered Regularly Interspaced Short Palindromic Repeats. Um, but it's a fantastic example of our scientists repurposing a natural technology and using it as a sophisticated tool. This is a way for bacteria to cut out foreign DNA. You may not know this, but there are viruses that affect, infect bacteria called bacteriophages. And the bacteria, in order to protect themselves, have developed this enzymatic machinery that can recognize foreign DNA. Some researcher was looking at this and said, wait a minute, if we have an enzyme that can recognize a particular sequence of DNA where we can use that to locate a particular region to potentially edit. The part that edits it is Cas9. It can insert DNA where a cut occurs from CRISPR. And there's other things that the Cas9 enzyme can do. This is just an example in myotonic dystrophy myoblasts. So one of those cell lines from people that we already talked about. On the left side, you can see the RNA inclusions that are characteristic of the disease inside the nuclei. You can see the muscle blind protein, the regulatory protein being bound up, and you can see the two are overlying. They delivered the gene editing equipment to the cells using a viral vector and you can see it got inside the cells and it was able to cut out that CTG repeat. And you can see that got rid of those RNA inclusions. So on a molecular level, they were able to cure those cells. So when we think of the ways that we might be thinking of using this gene editing technology, one way we just mentioned, which would be to cut out that CTG repeat entirely, Another way though that we might use it would be to deliver something different to the cell. In this case, a stop signal, a stop signal that tells it don't transcribe this long repeat of CTGs. Another way you can do it is you can interfere with the normal regulatory processes that cause transcription, or you could even have that enzyme 
target those RNA inclusions like some of our other RNA-based therapeutics. And I just want to finish with saying a few words about stem cells. Of all the things people ask me about, I probably get the most questions about stem cells. I think there's an impression that it's in a way the Shangri-La of treatments and that a stem cell can become anything. And so why not a piece of muscle and grow back the muscle? There are really two strategies that are being considered. One of them, are cells derived from embryonic tissue. This is now highly regulated and certain states won't allow this to occur. But the other way is to take cells from your body, from your fat cells, and we use chemicals to engineer them back into an earlier type of cell, a stem cell. This is not so different than the technologies we use to immortalize the cell models we talked about earlier. There's challenges faced by both. How do we grow enough cells to deliver? How many cells and how often? And in both, the primary mechanism is likely cells secreting factors which are protective to the muscle as opposed to them actually growing new muscle, which is I think what people are interested in. There's still quite a bit of work that needs to be done. There were prior studies transplanting our own version of muscles, a stem cells called satellite cells into boys who had Duchenne muscular dystrophy, but that didn't show a benefit. So as we think about the future, we have many companies, many different classes of drugs, small molecules, RNA-based therapies, gene therapies, we need to ensure we have tools to support this drug development and ensure we understand myotonic dystrophy so we can tell when these drugs are working or when they're not, which brings me to the end of my talk. And I wanna talk a little bit more about collaboration. If you remember, we have a large effort going on um, sponsored by the Myotonic Dystrophy Clinical Research Network which has sites in the US, the UK, and Europe. We have a large study going on now to help build those tools, the biomarkers and clinical endpoints that are really essential for these gene-based therapies. It has funding from multiple sources. And there's many ways that you can be involved in the process when we think about clinical trials. One way is you can participate. And if that's something you want to do, we'll just find an open study and you can volunteer. Your time and your effort is, is invaluable to the drug development process and to our understanding of myotonic dystrophy. But there are also many other ways that you can volunteer if maybe a drug study doesn't seem right to you. We have external advisory committees we form which help give us direction on what kinds of studies we're going to do. When we start to run a study, we form a patient advisory committee who gives us feedback as we do the study about things like recruitment and retention and how to get out the results of the study. We'll often run focus groups to find out what people are thinking about different things, study designs, outcome measures, things we're planning to do. If you wanna take part, or if you're interested in doing this, all you need to do is reach out and let us know. We keep a list of people who are interested in volunteering. And when we have a new study or we're forming one of these new committees, we'll make sure we can keep uh, reach out to you and get you on it. You can reach out to our project manager for the Myotonic Dystrophy Research Network study, who's at BCU, um, Jessica St. Romain, uh, Nick Johnson in his trial preparedness study uh, workshop tomorrow will give you more information about this. But you can contact me and my team directly as well. My project manager, Kylie Higgs, her number here and her email is happy to take your information and we'll pass it along to the right person. You can look for studies by going to clinicaltrials.gov. And again, I think they'll give you a demonstration of how to do that and how to search it. 
um, tomorrow during the workshop. And finally, of course, you can go to the MDF website, which has a tremendous number of very useful resources that you can take advantage of. I want to thank you very much for your time, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Stallin. That was fantastic. It was an incredible overview and I think very helpful for many of us to understand so much more about what's happening and all the different approaches that can be taken. We do have a few questions coming that have come in already, but I uh, wanted to just remind people, if you do have a question now, please go ahead and type it in to, um, some folks are able to get into the chat here on Zoom and some folks are typing into the wall of the session and that is fine either way. Um, please go ahead and send, send Dr. Statlin your best questions. Uh, one question, I think you may have answered this pretty clearly, but it was, how do we get involved in clinical trials that are starting right now? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. And I, you know, I, I think that unfortunately, our, our current process is a little opaque if you've never done it before. There is a registry, it's, it's run by the US government. It has a very easy name to remember. It's called clinicaltrials.gov, that's the website. You can just enter myotonic dystrophy in the search field and it'll give you a list of active studies. Every study essentially in the world that's an interventional study, a drug study is required to register at these websites. And so it'll be listed there and there'll be contact information. It'll tell you what they're doing, who they're looking for. And at the end of the listing, you'll see emails and phone numbers. They're expecting you to contact them. They won't feel out of place if you just reach out and say, hey, I saw this, I wanna know more. They'll send you information. You can also reach out to Tanya in the MDF. They have this information also summarized on their website and they're a fantastic resource. And we're always happy if you reach out to us to direct you to what other studies we have active at our sites right now, or we can direct you to one of those resources to learn more. That's fantastic. Thank you. Um, we have another question that wasn't covered, I don't believe, in your presentation. And it takes a little bit of uh, a turn, but it is related to the RNA research that you were discussing. And there's a lot of talk about RNA and mRNA, particularly due to the pandemic. Can you give a little bit of an explanation as to why or how the mRNA for the COVID vaccines is a little bit different than any of those RNA therapies that you were talking about today for myotonic dystrophy? And could there be adverse effects or crossovers from getting a vaccine previously? Yeah, so I, I do get this question quite a bit. I, you know, what I would say right now to, to reassure you, there, there is no evidence to date that there'll be any crossover or interaction um, between the two. They are similar, but slightly different. And the vaccine, what they're giving you is a, a, a copy of a recipe for a particular protein. It's a little protein that sits on the surface of the COVID molecule. They suspend it in a lipid and they just give it to you by injecting it into your muscle and then it diffuses out into your body. Your, your cells that are particularly attuned to foreign invaders take it up and when they get that mRNA, they actually make it. They'll make a little piece of that protein, and that protein's what spurs your immune system. The RNA drugs that we're talking about are a little different. They're not really mRNA to make a particular protein. They mimic RNA regulatory molecules, and there's really hundreds of them that are in our cells. And what they'll do is they'll direct the cells to do particular things. The sequences that make them up make them specific, so they won't do the same thing that what the vaccine does. They'll target something very different. In this case, those large inclusions we talk about or that particular gene on chromosome 19 involved in myotonic dystrophy. 
And the way we get them to you is also likely going to be a little different. We're likely to attach them to something that gets them specifically to your muscle versus other types of tissues like what's making your immune response. I hope that helps. Thank you. Oh, we do have another question that just came in. Um, many of us are in older registries like the Rochester registry versus MDF's newer registry. Um, they're asking if the registry owners are collaborating, if they're matching registry registrants actively to clinical trials. And I can, I can answer that from the MDF perspective. Um, and that is that we are actively communicating with folks who are registered in the myotonic dystrophy family registry that's run by MDF. So we have sent out in the last, I would think it was uh, within the last four to six weeks, we did send out notification of the three clinical trials that are launched this year, as well as the work that's being done by the DMCRN for the NDM1 study. Um, so we are actively uh, communicating with as many folks as we can. And if you're not already registered, please, you can get to our registry on the conference website, actually, or you can go to the MDF website and do that as well. So we are doing our best to get as much information to folks as possible. So I don't know if you have more to add to that, Dr. Statlin. But. Well, I mean, I think the, the Rochester registry is, has also been around a while. The, the way the Rochester registry works is a little different. Um, any company who's doing a clinical trial can approach them and can ask them for help with recruitment. And if they do, then they'll send a, an email out to everyone in the registry who might qualify. And it would tell you, it would give you information about the study and how to contact them. Unfortunately, it is a little difficult for us to match those people up between different registries. There have been several efforts over the years in rare diseases to do this. Um, but a lot of the registries were started before um, we really thought of doing this. And so it may not be quite as easy to just blend them together, but, but people are aware of this. Most of the companies will use both when they're looking for people. I think you, anyone who is interested in the companies at this point who are launching clinical trials this year, they the three that are launched for 2021 are here at the conference. So AMO, Harmony and Avidity all have exhibitor booths and you can go and talk with them directly. Um, many of the other companies are going to be launching clinical trials in the next 12 to 18 months, 24 months. And you can talk with them as well. Just go in and, and have a chat and see. As soon as we have that type of information from folks, we will send it out to, to registry, but we will also send it out to the MDF um, entire database. So even if you're not in the registry, you should get some updates about what's happening on that front. Are there any other questions for Dr. Statland? We're getting close on time, but I think we might have one more minute or so to answer questions. Doesn't look like it. I think you answered everything. Um, well, if people have questions later, they can leave them for me. I'll try to get to them. No. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Statlin, for being with us today and for sharing all of your knowledge and expertise. This was incredibly helpful and educational and helped to connect a lot of dots, I think, for, for many of us. So we appreciate you being here. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. All right. Bye-bye. Have a good afternoon, everyone. We'll see you in the next session.